Please welcome our host today, Nisha Pillai. Welcome. Hi, Ewan. You forgot something there, huh? <laughs> Thank you. It's a great intro from Ewan, wasn't it? I couldn't believe he said, a scientist running this extraordinary energy unit at NTNU. I feel sick to my stomach, he said. How often do you hear scientists talking like that? I feel sick to my stomach at the pass at which we have reached. Okay, so how can we turn that revulsion that you and several other people in this room feel into something that is productive today? Hmm? How? We've got to make these conversations meaningful, purposeful. We've got to make them move beyond the usual usual, right? Here are some of the things we're going to discuss today. At the heart, probably, of our discussions is this giant machine this clunking, slow-moving, lumbering machine called the energy system. Is it really, as we keep hearing, on the point of some kind of major transformation? Are we going to make this extraordinary transformation, transition to a better world? Hmm? That's at the heart of what we're discussing today. And will that in itself be a sufficient prize to deliver to us the sustainable society. That's the whole game, isn't it? Creating the sustainable society. What is the link between the energy system and that prize? Hmm? In the course of our discussions, we will be looking at various energy technologies, of course, their shortcomings, their potential, but also how they work together. Where are the gaps? What are the missing pieces that we all need to address? And of course, we mustn't forget that sick to the stomach feeling that Ewan was talking about. What is the role of all of us as individuals, as active citizens? Not the them out there, the government, the policy makers. We, we can always deflect it to them, right? But what is the role of all of us as active citizens in trying to crank up the momentum, hmm? unlock that potential? so that we make this not just a mission impossible, but a mission real. Hmm? That's our mission. Are we going to do it, ladies and gentlemen? Are we going to hear from the four corners of this room? Yeah. Fabulous. Are you ready for the mission? Yeah. Great. Well, let's start then. We're going to start by looking at the role of universities and research organizations. Hmm? Very, very important in getting those ideas, the first ideas off the ground. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the rector of NTNU, Gunnar Bertham, and the CEO and president of Sintef, Alexander Bechgiel. Please come up to this stage. Hi. Thank you for joining us, Alexander Gunnar. So we started this morning with the the charisma and the appeal of that young woman whose name we all now know, Greta. And she's forcing us, our generation, to, fo to address the needs of the youth and the future. Has that actually changed in any way your priorities, your focus? What does that actually mean? I think, I think what we've seen and what we've heard and what we've seen in the streets these days bring us more focused. And it gives us the obvious sense of urgency. More than changing the direction, the sense of urgency is the importance because researchers know a lot, our institutions know a lot, but we need to speed up. If I can add to Alexander? That, yeah, I, I spend in my work a lot of time with business leaders and for the last half year I've made it a point to start every meeting with the IPCC report, the last one, and saying that, you know, the goal is not a low emission society. Can I just stop you there for a minute, Alexandra? <laughs> yeah. Can we hear Alexandra at the back of the room? Yeah. Really clear? Okay, cool. My Please mother would just say, speak louder. <laughs> <laughs> she can teach I'm you something. <laughs> she can teach. We can all learn. All right. But Go let me get it. back to the... the so, I, 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 I try to get the industry leaders to reflect on the fact that while we have some intermediate goals, the goal is really a net zero emission society, right? And they are quite inspired and they see business opportunities, but they see that the politicians need to change some of the ground rules. And that's where the kids come in. I was there on Friday with my two daughters at, in front of the Stortinger 
And I looked up at the windows, and it was just full of politicians, and they stayed for an hour. They were watching this. Very, they were very up serious. there watching. They weren't they were down on the ground with you. Well, or I, some it, weren't. Well, anyway, I just think this has huge political impact, and it, it might actually change the dialogue. But my question dialogue. was, how has it changed your focus at Sintef? How has it changed your focus here at NTNU? Has it actually changed anything? What does it mean that you have more, more uh, urgency? I think that when we made a new strategy, and both institutions have just been through a strategy process, the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals came up as an important mission. And you may discuss, uh, should universities have a strategy? Shouldn't they be academic free institutions? But it, it was <laughs> obvious to us that we wanted a, a direction, and we wanted this direction to be very firm and well communicated. And therefore, I think it's fair to say that not only this action on Friday, but the whole message from the people, and especially from the young people, it makes the universities clearer, and it makes our institutions clearer. And for us, this is about technology shifts, which is not uh, coming from itself, and it's about translation of technology to community and to politicians. It, it also, in a way, the fact that you see the energy driving, that there's a momentum for change, makes you more responsible about, or think even more about the responsibility of the av advice you're giving. Because some really difficult choices to make, and I think politicians are bombarded with different uh, ideas, and trying to make sure you use all the knowledge in the organization to give good advice to the politicians. Because so we talk a lot about politicians have to make these decisions, set a path, make policy decisions, put money into big projects, mm -hmm. etc. And the, the transition, the, um, these new energy technologies are seen as very expensive, and indeed they are very expensive. Mm -hmm. So what is the prize then that you can hold out, not just the sustainable world, but jobs, a new economy, growth? Is that something that you use as a way of motivating this? Yeah. Is decision making? I think when there's so tremendous trans well, transformation to be made, uh, the cards are dealt again. There are lots of opportunities to take uh, new business positions, to uh, create new jobs. Um, and there's a huge risk of losing positions. And oh, so for, yeah, that's the, always the worry, isn't yeah. it? Well, so, so tell you us need the to prize of the, of one sec, Gunnar. So in, in terms of the projects you're working on right now in Sintef, mm -hmm. can you? Can you take the curtain aside on one or two for us to tell us what you think is going to be you know, well, a I really good industry for the future? Well, I think seen from a Norwegian point of view, uh, autonomous shipping, is, uh, zero emission shipping is incredibly interesting. We have this one ship. Those underway. ferries that are going across? Well, it's, it, now it's, a, it's an industrial company that has, is building a fully automated zero emission ship that will move 40,000 trucks off the road. Uh, take the emissions and the congestion away, and they will cut their costs significantly and be in a better position. And then we see... And you could sell it to the world. I mean, that is exactly. an look extraordinary at, Look at the coastal populations all over the world. I was in China last week. I asked, do you see climate change? How do you see it? And they say, we all live along the coast, so we're really worried. But the fact that the United States is not caring is a good business opportunity for us. <laughs> We all should look at it that way. Don't just berate them, say, well, we'll steal that pie. Gunnar, you were going to say. No, I, I just think we shouldn't underestimate the power of a transition need. And this is about transition. And uh, in these last hundred years, Norway has been through some important transitions. We had hydropower in 1917, started with a hydropower lab. And we got to know how energy system works. And then we got the oil and gas in 1969, and we knew the energy, and then we learned about offshore industry, how to run that. Now we're urgent to go to renewable energy forms. We know the energy system, we know the offshore, and we could translate this into... So, so if you look back at the last 100 years, yes. since the hydropower came, are there any lessons you can learn about how these transitions move, how speedily yes. they move, whether people underestimate or overestimate their there's power? Point one, there's always a fear that our labor will, will lose labor f possibilities. That has never happened in, in, in uh, technology shifts. 
So people it always, always worry that jobs will go. It has always developed more jobs, uh, different jobs, more important jobs than doing a work we could automize. So the fear of labor loose is probably not, uh, should, we should not be afraid of that. Then again, it, it, it always is difficult to start the transition. And all of a sudden, it goes quicker than we think. Sort of a ketchup bottle effect. Mm. The, the transition struggle. always goes quicker than people think it will. It the way we've seen solar power sort of came from nowhere and just took off. Right. right. In 2005, I was told that you shouldn't invest in solar because it's the Gucci renewable, only good to make you look uh, fancy at party. <laughs> and now it's the biggest uh, growing solar energy. But there are some technologies that don't fly. Mm. I mean, you have to make a few failures as well, and you have to be willing to risk some of that. So you have to take risks. Mm. So we're going to have to think very hard about those technologies that may not fly in the course of today. Where should we still be skeptical? Mm. And where should we follow the lead from Gunnar and, mm. and Alexandra and just go with it? Yes, Gunnar. And I have an expectation to this meeting, to this conference, because the knowledge in the panel, in the audience, is huge. We need to, un to make the society understand it, like the youngsters did on Friday, we need to translate it into possible messages which we can afford, we can do, and we can get all of us to take part in. Because as, as she said, we have the knowledge, but we, don't, we haven't yet really taken it into, uh, into uh, politics, into what we do every day, every individual. So you're sort of hinting towards possibly the limits of technology and science uh, to um, the interaction with, with all of us, with human society and behavior. And I want all of us to be ambassadors for the important messages, because we have the knowledge, you will discuss the solutions, and we should bring that forward also to the general audience. So therefore, this conference is important, and therefore we look forward to the messages coming out of it. Mm -hmm. So what's missing then, Alexandra? Well, I, th I think, uh, you know, a sense of urgency, uh, mm -hmm. sense of embracement of, of uh, new things. Uh, everybody needs, of course, in their own lives to take responsibility. And I think there's so many invisible things that can be done. So we are the keenies, but then... But uh, we've known this for a long time, haven't we? Yes. We know there's a kind of urgent. We know we need to take, and yet we don't. So. Well, it's, a burning, it's the burning platform phenomenon, right? And the fact that we see all this uh, um, crazy weather these days, I, I, just, I think it's good that journalists make a lot of stories about crazy weather. I think ultimately people will see that this, this is part of what makes changes, but also celebrate successes. And everybody wants us to say that technology is not important, so I decided here I will fight for technology actually being important. Uh, for example, I don't know whether the owners of supermarkets all over Europe know that by changing the cooling agent in their freezers, they have removed 26 million tons of CO2 equivalents, CO2 equivalents. Uh, that's half of Norway's emissions. I'm not sure the supermarket owners know this. If you celebrate them, maybe they will look for new opportunities. Okay, so even quite simple, or maybe yeah. not simple, but quite targeted interventions mm -hmm. can have huge effects, yeah. or um, significant effects and always celebrate the victories. Mm. That's the way humans learn. Always celebrate the victories. Make heroes. Okay, Make so we're gonna have lots of victories to celebrate today, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for getting us going. Thank you. Good night, Alexander Bekhjev. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.